Okay, so let's get started. People might come in, but uh, we can start. Uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to Harvard CMSA Quantum Matter in Math and Physics Seminar Series. Okay, today, so oh, sorry. There's some echo from this uh, YouTube, but okay, let me continue. Uh, today we are very honored to have a Professor Simon Ketterow from uh, Syracuse University. And Professor Simon Ketterow studied at uh, his PhD at uh, Oxford University. And currently he's, he works at uh, Syracuse University as a professor. He has done a wide range of work on strongly correlated and strong couple dynamical systems, including uh, QCD and other quantum field theory with uh, was also supersymmetry. And he's also an expert on latest QCD. It is our honor to welcome him to telling us uh, his recent work. And his title will be Chiral Lattice Theories from Steger Fermions. And let's welcome uh, Simon. Thank you, Yuvin, and, and the other organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm gonna talk about a, a recent proposal to construct uh, a lat lattice theories, which are capable of targeting a specific class of lattice theory really, which are capable of targeting uh, chiral fermions I'm gonna argue in the continuum limit, or, or indeed a, a chiral gauge theory in the end. Um, uh, so that's, the, that's going to be the, uh, the goal. Um, uh, please, um, Talk, uh, stop me if you want to ask questions. I, I think that would be great. In fact, I don't have that many slides, so I'm rather counting on you stopping me to ask lots of questions. I've uh, given this talk a couple of times now, or variations of it, um, and it's uh, it's always worked out very well, providing people ask lots of questions. So, so please, if there's no no question that's too dumb to ask, I realize this audience is not a typical lattice gauge theory audience, or or, or even um, particle physics audience necessarily. So again. Um, I'm more than happy to explain anything that looks unfamiliar to you. Okay. Okay. And we just have to get to wake up. There we go. Okay. So this is the plan of the talk. Um, I'll spend a, a little bit of time at the beginning um, telling you why you might be interested in chiral lattice fermions uh, and why it's been so difficult uh, to really come up with a formulation that's capable of describing them. Um, and in this context, I'll be thinking about a, a Euclidean path integral for a lattice theory. Um, I'll spend a bit of time telling, telling you a little bit about staggered fermions and particularly things called reduced staggered fermions. And so the, they'll be a key component of the construction I'll, I'll discuss. So I'll spend a bit of time talking about that. The other key component we'll need is the idea of symmetric mass generation, which is something that has been pioneered in the condensed matter um, literature for a number of years now. And so we will try to use symmetric mass generation as, as part of our mechanism for constructing um, a theory with a chiral continuum limit. Um, on the way to, to uh, writing down a specific set of our interactions which are capable of doing this symmetric mass generation, we'll uh, encounter an anomaly. It'll be an anomaly which is kind of specific or unique to staggered fermions or rather the generalizations uh, um, the sort of generalizations of staggered fermions to arbitrary lattices, arbitrary triangulations with arbitrary topology. And that will, and, and it will be necessary to, to, to go off the torus to some other topology in order to expose this anomaly. And I'll say a little bit about that. Um, then I'll get into the sort of the guts of the uh, chiral fermion proposal specifically, i.e. the structure of the Yukawa interactions. Um, so it'll depend on something called the site parity, which I'll tell you about as we go along. I will borrow uh, the structure directly from, uh, I guess it's fitkowski kataev's uh, interaction. Uh, this is an interaction for Majorana fermions um, that was written down more than a decade ago at this point. We'll, we'll essentially be using the same structure here imported into this relativistic lattice theory. And I'll show you how it's consistent with the cancellation of this anomaly uh, that's specific to staggered fermions. All right. Um, uh, and then I'll spend a little bit of time uh, assuming that symmetric mass generation works, and that's a non perturbative statement, but assuming it works, I'll discuss a little bit about why the, the theory actually becomes chiral then in the continuum limit. If I have time, uh, I'll 
a sketch a connection to the Paris Salam gut model as well at the end. And then I'll say I have a few words on the future. Um, so there are a couple of papers here which describe most of what I'm talking about today. The first is mostly lattice. The second is actually mostly in the continuum. All right, so motivation and problems. So why? So we'd like a non-perturbative definition of a chiral gauge theory. Um, you would like that this, there are pedagogical reasons for that, right? You would like to write down some sort of path integral which defines what you mean by the theory. In the same way, you can write down a path integral for lattice QCD and define QCD in some appropriate limiting procedure from that lattice path integral, right? So you would like it just for, you'd like to understand chiral theories outside of perturbation theory. Um, and there are also strong practical reasons for doing it too. There's very little known about the strong coupling dynamics of chiral theories. There are issues like massless composite states that have been conjectured, dynamical symmetry breaking, things like that, which you'd like to get a handle on with you know, non-perturbative methods, all right? Uh, and the only non-perturbative regulator we have right now, essentially, is the lattice. So there's a strong motivation to consider, right from the outset, putting chiral fermions on a lattice. All right, and and, and it's been this was tried in the very early days of lattice gauge theory, so 30, 40 years ago at this point, and and there've been a series of barriers to doing it, which probably most of you are familiar with. The famous nielsen niemeyer theorem really sort of guarantees that whatever lattice theory you start with. It has to be vector light. It therefore, in the continuum limit, it yields equal numbers of left and right-handed states. And that's pretty much a uh, constraint on anything you do. Um, and the strategy, uh, that one strategy that's been pursued, and it's the same strategy we'll be using here, is, to, is the idea of a mirror model. So you want, to, you want to start with one of these lattice vector-like theories, and you want to try to gap or decouple states of a single chirality, leaving a low energy theory, which, has, which is chiral. Um, and there have been many, this has been tried in a, um, a bunch of different models over the years, going back really to the mid 80s. And, and almost, and also more recently, as recently as two or three years ago, there was a, a new effort made in this regard, uh, several actually. Um, and various formulations have been used, naive fermions, so-called domain wall fermions, overlap fermions, staggered fermions actually. Uh, and there's been actually little success, sadly. And, and one way to understand generically what happens is that typically bilinear fermion condensates form, which break symmetries and end up coupling the left and right-handed states. So you start off with a theory where you've fought, it looks like you've managed to gap, say the right-handed states, or at least you've decoupled them from the left, but they tend to recouple again through these condensates. And that's been a generic problem uh, uh, I, that goes back, as I say, to the early eighties or so. So in this proposal, uh, or in this talk, I, I want to talk about a new lattice mirror model, which uses these things called reduced staggered fermions. That's sort of a basic ingredient. So I'll tell you about those. And we're gonna to try to take those uh, reduced staggered fermion formulations and, and gap out half the states without breaking symmetries. And I'm gonna use interactions, as I said before, basically borrowed from condensed matter theory, right? I'll show you that the model satisfied a certain discrete anomaly constellation conditions. And, and these have been relatively recently discovered, I think. Uh, and the connection to symmetric mass generation has also been pointing it, pointed out before. And I'll, I'll show you the model I'm writing down, I, I think uh, is capable of symmetric mass generation, potentially at least, um, and certainly satisfies these discrete anomaly constellation conditions, which are sort of a necessary condition uh, to make progress. Excuse and then I'll say, yeah. as I said, sorry. Sorry, here I have a question to clarify. In the last slide, you mentioned that uh, uh, there is a uh, the failed decoupling because of the fermion condensation. Right. And uh, I saw the condensation mainly uh, causing a breaking of a symmetry. Uh -huh. So, uh, so, so do you mean the uh, they do not decouple means uh, symmetry breaking? I mean, if there is a condensate which couple, typically that condensate carries quantum numbers which couples both left and right. That's all I mean. Is that what you but mean? do you also mean the condensate also generate a gapless, additional gapless mode? Uh, I wasn't particularly thinking of that. I was thinking just I in think. terms of taking what would have been a chiral theory and basically producing a vector-like theory after the coupling. That I, I wasn't concerned about extra massless states, although that may indeed be true too. I see. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, if that's clear. All right. Anyway, 
Okay. Just, uh, Simon, I, I saw that you are trying to say that the, the left, let's say if you define chirality with left and right, uh -huh. you're trying to say the left and right may pair up together and fully gap without leveling over with, without that, left that over. Not, yes, that was that was, the most. that was what I meant. I mean, it, perhaps in certain situations there might be gold stones as well floating around. I, I wasn't even concerned about that particularly. I mean, what I'm concerned about is coupling left and right. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Just keep asking questions. And, and that's Sorry, fine. yeah, this part I'm confused because I thought in mirror fermion approach, uh, you only couple the, say, right fermion together trying to gap them. And the concern is that whether you can gap them without breaking symmetry, I think. Uh, right. Uh, I, I, because you're only, only Right hand fermion are coupled, and left hand fermion do not couple, so they automatically left alone. So I, th uh, I think it. Sorry. Carry there's on. some confusion here. Yeah. That's All right. I am not quite sure what the problem is. So the way you implement these interactions, of course, is by coupling them to an, some sort of scalar field. Yes. So it's a web of that scalar field which is causing the problem. But the scalar field only couple to right hand fermion, do not couple to left hand fermion, for example. Well, the models I'm thinking of, it does both. Oh, so, I see. So, 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 actually, actually, this is like a uh, this is like a proximity effect. It's like uh, when the right hand fermion has a mass, explicit the boson mass. This boson yeah. mass will inevitably also couple to the left hand fermion. There's no symmetry. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, that's I agree. But uh, certainly, if uh, the point is that if a symmetry is preserved, mm -hmm. and then uh, then there is no uh, symmetry preserving relevant operator to massless right, sector. Right. But the yeah. whole point. Is the but there's, is the but there's other. That's the details. Yeah, that's the details. Well, yes, yeah, that's that's why I mean. So what you said is also true. I mean, there's no symmetry reason to 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 forbid that that uh, that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Fermion mass. So the Fermion mass compensator will break some symmetry. Yeah. But then there's a proximity effect too. Okay. Yeah. Because, because I, I really try to get uh, uh, get clarified, you know, there's a common terminology, it's like decoupling, not decoupling. I try to understand what decoupling really means. Uh, in uh, I, Well, it means uh, different in, things uh, in different models. Yeah. So if you have a domain wall approach, it's quite different, the coupling, right? I see. So maybe it's too, I was being rather too specific, but in general modes get coupled and typically the, the, the theory I'm talking about, the, the worrying uh, issue will be a scalar field. Uh, but if you're in a domain wall approach, it might be overlapping two wave functions from two different boundaries, for example. Or even then, I think if you if you gap out the right-handed boundary, say by using quartic interactions, you will still end up with a, a symmetry-breaking verb which couples modes, I think, too. So it, it's generically a problem. Yeah. So symmetry is a key. Yeah. Maybe maybe it's key, clear. We're well, talking about the band to key here too. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right, and the, the and the point about whether you can gap the you know whether you can avoid symmetry broken phases is highly connected to the issue of anomalies, as you probably as I'm sure you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm just going to show you that explicitly in this lattice yeah. model in concrete terms. Yeah, great. So that, that's what I hope to do. Yeah, thank you. Right, so 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 there have been as as I noted here several proposals in the condensed matter literature over the last five plus years, more than that, I think. Um, uh, by Wen, Wang, Zhu, and, and various other people. Most of these uh, constructions are used Hamiltonian methods uh, and arguments from the continuum. And what I want to do here is sort of bridge the gap between that condensed matter literature and, and what's known in the lattice gauge theory literature, which is mostly focused on things like domain wall setups, and try to give you an explicit lattice path integral describing bona fide, well-recognized relativist lattice fermions that have a relativistic continuum limit and show how you can use this, the ideas of symmetric mass generation to remove certain modes in the theory and leave a, th a remaining theory, which in the continuum limit becomes chiral. It's not chiral in any non-zero lattice spacing, but only in the continuum limit. So it's an uh, attempt to bridge between sort of the lattice and the continuum in a concrete construction within the context of a Euclidean path integral. So, so in that way, it differs from most or some of the condensed matter proposals that I'm aware of, at least. I, I'm not an expert in all of the things that have, um, all the proposals out there, but the ones I've seen and looked at. 
All right, so, so let me tell you a little bit about Snagger uh, and, and then reduce staggered fermions because that's sort of the, the starting point to all of this analysis. So, so here's the action for a staggered fermion. So it involves, first of all, it involves single component fields, chi and chi bar, all right? So they don't have a spinner components, right? And they're just coupled through a symmetric difference operator. Uh, these phases out the front eta are well-known phases that arise in staggered fermions. This is the prescription in terms of the lattice coordinates xi. So they're just plus or minus one, depending on where you are, are on the lattice. If you ask where this uh, action comes from, well, if I take the Dirac theory and I simply naively discretize it on say a hypercubic lattice. So I just right place the derivatives by difference operators and just take the full uh, Dirac spinner on each lattice site. Then there's a particular unitary transformation, which depends on the lattice coordinates I can use to diagonalize, they call it spin diagonalize the spinner indices. So I can get, so I can bring the Dirac action, the naively discretized Dirac action into a form which is four copies of this theory. So what do you do to get staggered fermions or cogat suskin fermions is simply to throw away three of the identical copies and just keep a single copy, right? So it's like one of the spinner components in this rotated basis, all right? So this is a standard, uh, relativistic lattice action. Uh, it's used extensively in, in uh, simulations of lattice QCD and has been since the early days of lattice gauge theory. So this is a very conventional starting point. It perhaps is less familiar maybe to condensed matter uh, physicists, but I, I, this is, there's nothing controversial about this action whatsoever, all right? And it's well known that it describes four direct fermions in the continuum limit. So a vector-like theory still, okay? And it, it, precisely four. So I start off with a lot of fermion doubles and by throwing away basically four, uh, three of the copies, once I've spin diagonalized the action, I end up with just four. So 16 down to four. Simon, uh, so, sorry, may I ask uh, just to clarify? Sure. Here the index mu runs presumably over coordination of the lattice sites, is that right? The sum, the uh, eight uh, Right, so mu x plus yeah, yeah. No, it's on the direction, sorry. That's good. fine, yeah, that's just the direction. So it'll be a four dimensional lattice, for example. So it would run from one to four. Gotcha. And the, the assumption here is that the lattice is bipartite, so you think you like hypercubic lattice? Yes, in this case, that's right. We'll, we'll have to generalize this in the end to see this anomaly clearly, but th at the moment we're just sitting on a nice cubic or hypercubic lattice, torus if you want, so periodic boundary conditions. I just write these single component fields on every lattice side. I have a chi and a chi bar on each side, and I just couple the symmetric difference on chi to chi bar, and maybe you throw in a mass term. Um, coupling chi bar and chi directly on the site. So that's what it's called a staggered fermion. It's well understood. It's been used in lattice QCD for decades at this point. Gotcha. Yeah. And I'm coming from condensed matter, which is why I apologize for the. That's fine. No, it's, 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 I didn't put too much review on here because I wasn't sure, but this is fine to discuss it. Is, is, is this clear now? Um, I think so. And one last question to clarify which of them so far the fermions are not chiral, correct? You don't. Do so you have chiral? They're just single component objects. Yeah. Okay. Craftsman. Yep. No, I have to show you how to build chiral spinners out of this in the end. That's not clear at all. Uh, so I will do that, hopefully. So the question is, can I do any better than this? I've got a, a lattice action which has four Dirac fermions in the continuum limit. Um, if I set the mass to zero, then there's some further simplification I can do. So if I set the mass to zero, you'll notice that chi bar, say, on even sites only talks to chi on odd sites and vice versa. So in fact, this action decomposes into two independent pieces if the mass equals zero. And I can simply drop one of those pieces. And that gets me what's called the reduced staggered fermion action. Okay, so, I'm, so these chi plus minus subscripts just mean that I take chi on even or odd lattice sites. So this lattice site parity minus one to the sum over the coordinates, that's precisely related to what you were saying in terms of a bipartite lattice, okay? So this, action couples plus to minus basically, an even site to an odd site. And I just take, and now at this point, I only have one degree of freedom per site because I'm going to throw away say chi bar on minus sites and chi on plus sites and keep only chi bar on plus sites and chi on minus sites. So I've halved the number of degrees of freedom by this act, but I have to be massless, but that's okay. I'm shooting for chiral fermions. So that's, that's not a problem in, in the end at all. Okay, and there are these projectors which I'll use occasionally P plus minus, which are just precisely this. They're either zero or one, depending on whether the epsilon is plus or minus one, the, the lattice site parity. 
Is that clear to everybody? A question? Yeah. Uh, sorry, just make sure the notation. I, I think I, I think it should be clear that the, the chi plus minus will be uh, vial fermions. Uh, not at this point. No. Uh, in fact, well, I'll show you in a moment that this is still actually a perfectly vector-like theory. So it will describe not four direct fermions, but two direct fermions, because throw I throw away half the lattice, half the degrees of freedom. But it's still vector-like at this point. That's why I need various interactions to try to get to a chiral theory, because otherwise my continuum limit is still. But should I regard chi plus or minus regard as left or right? Handed vial fermions? No, I mean, it looks analogous to decomposing a direct spinner into left and right pieces. It's completely analogous, but it's, but in fact, each one of these staggered fields still yields uh, two direct fermions in the continuum limit, right? So there's still an, a fermion replication going on, which is you know, related to fermion doubling in, in the originally. Okay. Is that okay? Well, so these yeah. guys don't yeah, make spinners yet. Right? I have to tell you how to make the spinners out of the chi's. And then what I'm telling you is that at this point, this reduced staggered field is still going to yield a direct theory in the continuum limit. Well, that's related to a question. Uh, maybe I'm going to ask about how the kinetic term coupled the chi plus with chi minus. In that sense, it's also not quite uh, well for me. So It just follows because it's a symmetric difference operator, right? So if I sit on an even parity site, I'm only going to talk to odd parity sites next, next door. Right. That, okay. That's all. It's 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 not a yeah. Okay. Uh, one one last thing about notation. Can you explain this eta mu of x, which written on the top, mm -hmm. minus one to the summation of this x i? So this will be just plus or minus one side. But yeah, I'm not plus sure. Plus or minus one of the site, which depends on the exact site, because it it sums the indices of the site coordinates from one up to mu minus one. Oh. So I should take a i is running from one to four, one, two, three, yes. four. If I'm in four dimensions. But when mu is zero, how do you take mu to zero? When mu is zero. I, no, I, well, you can, you can run it from zero if you want. There are only four values. You no, know, you I said, can... Sorry, sorry. I said when mu is one, then mu minus one, zero. How is that summation mean? So mu is one, two, three, four, right? So you oh, sum so it's one. Nine. It's taken to be one in that case. I see what you're saying. Sorry, yeah. yes. But it's just mu. So, so the summation is i from I... Yes, so the the phase that you're saying for mu equals one, the phase is one. Hello? You guys hearing me? Uh, sorry, my Wi-Fi may be not stable, so I didn't hear. Oh, so so yes, so the for mu equals one, the phase is one. Right. So maybe there's some, I maybe have to tweak that uh, subscript to make sure it's clear. These are, we won't have any course to use these aiders explicitly. So nothing will map, depend on this at all. And in fact, this is not unique. This is in one particular basis. In fact, all you need is that you have a series of Z2 valued fields living on the links, such when I go around a plaquette, I get minus one. So it's like you can build this thing as a Z2 gauge theory if you want, where the aiders are like Z2 fields but they have a constraint that the product around a single plaquette is minus one. That's if you want the most general way of writing it down. And that shows you, you can change the definitions of the aiders by sort of local Z2 gauge transformations. So there's nothing specific. This particular formula is one convenient representation, but it's not the only one. Okay, are just make sure. Are you trying to introduce maybe, you know, conceptually, are you trying to introduce two types of fermion parity on two types of sub lattices? Is that what you are trying to do? I'm just saying that on a hypercubic lattice, I can la label any lattice site as even or odd. Just using this epsilon thing. Okay. Okay, so thanks. Is, that's all. Right. So it, it decomposes. It's this bipartite condition that someone mentioned earlier. Right. I'll show you, in fact, there's a generalization of epsilon, which works on any triangulation. So we won't be stuck with that completely in the end. So maybe I, I will, that will become clearer, but for the moment, that's what it is on the moment on a hypercubic lattice. Okay, it's, I, I'm at, did I answer your question, Ruben? Are you? Yeah, probably, but uh, actually, I, I don't really understand the meaning of eta mu there. I'm not sure the, the rule it plays. Oh, where does it come from? I mean, I, I could show you how you get to the eta mu's. 
they just come from commuting gamma matrices around each other and the position in the string of gamma matrices is where it determines the phase. If, if you like, I can, I have, I think, a slide at the end that I'm not planning to use, but um, I can just show you where they come from. Does that be helpful? Uh, I think uh, I just need a, a sentence description. What does the eta mu play? So, certainly it's related to gamma mu, but I'm not sure. Yes, it's, it's kind of a discrete version of gamma mu, but it's X dependent. It's not a constant. But, but it also de depends on directional mu, right? Yep. And also depends on X. The, so you have to sum the lattice coordinates up to mu minus one, right? So it depends on the direction mu and it depends on the coordinate positions. You know, you have a, say you're in four dimensions, you have a four coordinates, X one to X four, say. Okay. Well, maybe I'll make this comment later because it, it looks, I don't know whether it's ready to a vector symmetry in some sense, what the people talk about in more like a fracton type of a theory. When you, you when you discuss later, I, you, 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 you may, Mention that, and I'll, I'll make another comment. Well, if you want to think of the eta mu as z two gauge fields, that's fine too. But there is a constraint that the, not that the that the, it's not a flat connection. It's one where the product of the eta's around the plaquette is minus one everywhere. So it's like beta tends to minus infinity for an z two gauge theory. That's another way of doing it. Okay. Yeah. What. Well I think you will show something later, and I will. Ask. I, I can. I can even go to the very. Ed, when we get further on, if it comes up again, I'll. I'll, I'll show yeah. you where the. Yeah, please go on. Please go on. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Assume that every x i takes on even number of values, like the uh, length of that is i that is is even. Uh, you, the lattice has to be even. That's correct. For staggered fermions. Yeah. Okay, so let me. I want to show you that you can think of these reduced staggered fields um, actually as a sort of analog of a Majorana field. So that's an important sort of uh, ingredient too. So the first thing is that I'm keeping only a chi or a chi bar on each side, depending on whether it's an even or odd parity. So since I only have one degree of freedom, one Grassmann variable per site, I might as well just call bar chi bars on, on plus sites. I might as well just call them uh, chi's, right? So that's just a trivial relabeling. And so I can just then go back and write down my, uh, if you want, my free action is a coupling of chi to chi through the symmetric difference operator. And the ADAM is still carried along for, for the ride too. All right, so this is the starting action I'm starting with. And I'm going to now give these guys a label A, which runs from one to the number of flavors. So I'm just going to imagine an N flavor theory. So I have N copies of one of these reduced staggered fields um, si uh, sitting on my lattice. And because of this structure, you see it's rather natural to restrict the symmetries, the flavor symmetries of these chi's to be sort of like SO symmetries, sort of re naturally associated with sort of real flavor rotations. Um, that's not absolutely essential, it turns out. But since we're shooting for theories which ha should have no perturbative anomalies, it will be a very convenient uh, way to go. And it will match into the condensed matter theory kind of interactions I need later. So I'm going to assume at the moment that this there's some SON symmetry, if you want, connecting these that the, these chi's rotate under. All right. All right. So the but this action has a bunch of other symmetries. It also has what's called a shift symmetry. So I can take the chi's and I can translate them by one lattice spacing. And then I introduce another phase called xi here associated with that. And that xi is also given by it's sort of a complementary sum to the one we had before. Uh, for the ADAs. So there's another um, set of phases you can associate it with this. And you can show this action's invariant under this shift uh, from come from chi of x to chi of x plus mu with this additional phase. So it turns out these shifts are related to continuum flavor symmetry. So if I take the naive continuum limit, these shifts, um, I said there's more than one direct fermion involved here. So there's an in, in the continuum limit, this theory inherits a flavor symmetry. And these shifts are sort of discrete subroutes of that continuous flavor symmetry. That's not critical to what we're saying right now, but a, a, a lattice gauge theorist would think of it that way. These shift symmetries are connected to, to, to uh, flavor symmetries in the continuum limit. Uh, obviously, the theory is also invariant under various discrete rotations in the lattice. These are, again, we're in Euclidean space, so these are the analogs of Lorentz transformations. So the theory is, so if you want, invariant under a subgroup of the Lorentz group, and a subgroup of a continuum flavor group, which tell, tells me how many direct fermions I have. 
So if I go back to full staggered fermions, I had four direct fermions. So naively, there's an SU4 flavor symmetry in the continuum element. When I go to these Majorana fields, it's reduced to basically to just an SO4, or in fact, yeah, an SO4 flavor symmetry. So, so I'm just enumerating symmetries right now of this rather simple action. But there's an also a crucial additional U1 symmetry, which will play the very important role in what we're going to discuss, which is I can take the chi's and I can rotate them by a single phase, the U1 phase, where this epsilon, this site parity sits upstairs in the phase. So the reason this is a symmetry is obvious. If I take, since this couples even to odd sites and vice versa, I'll get one sign of the phase for even sites and one sign for odd. And so the kinetic term is actually invariant under this U1 symmetry. And these symmetries, uh, you can easily show, basically protect the theory from any kind of fermion bilinear terms you want to write down, whether it be on-site or off-site, all right? And this thing now describes two massless Dirac, or since I'm thinking of these as essentially analogs of Majorana fermions, four Majorana fermions in the continuum limit. That will be the convenient way to think about this. So a reduced staggered fermion, it's still not a chiral theory in the continuum limit, but it does describe four Majorana fermions in the continuum. And this is not a controversial statement either. It's a, this is, if you want, uh, plucked from the mainstream of lattice gates theory. I will say that reduced aggregate fermions are not typically used in lattice QCD. And the reason for that is basically practical. Um, if you couple this to an SU3 gauge field, then when you integrate the fermions out, you get some sort of determinant and that determinant is complex. So it has a horrible sign problem. So that is the reason that mostly lattice QCD is focused on staggered fermions and not reduced staggered fermions because these reduced guys in the theories that interest most people have sign problems. We won't have that problem here, or at least I'll show you some numerical results where we where would seem to be compatible right now with no sign problem. I, and we'll have more, I'll have more to say about that when we get home. But anyway, that's historically why these things were not looked at too much in the lattice I mean, reduced staggered fermions appear in a paper in like 1983, but you will find very few papers after that because they weren't practically useful for what people wanted to do, All right? But they turn out to be, I think, key for this construction. Excuse me. Yeah. Is it, is it a good time to ask? No, uh, anytime. Yes, so the the, the cosine mu of x, yep. defined there, actually, it looks different from what was written in your paper. I just want to make sure whether, which one has typo. Is it uh, minus one to the sum of this i running from u plus one to the four? Is there oh, some- Oh, I'm sorry, there's a typo. It should be x, 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 x. Right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, so, there's a typo yes. there. Thank you. Let, that's a comment I'm going to make because this symmetry you are defining actually depend on the, the space coordinates, x. So these yeah. are vector global symmetry that we talk about in fracton-like system, I, I believe. Ah. Okay, very good. Very good, okay. Yeah, so this form of xi mu should be like eta mu. It's minus one to the sum over xi. Right, xi and uh, xi, right? Yeah, they some xi, xi, xi I don't know how many times I've stared at that and not seen yeah, that. So there are, there are some notation inconsistency. I was very confused. But the mu here in this this slide will be running from zero to three, right? Or one to four or what, however you want to do it. Yeah, there are four what, values if I'm in four. What you write what here will be zero to three, zero, one, two, three. Well, the earlier slide is one to four, I guess. Anyway, so. yeah. I mean, there are various conventions, but yeah, there are, if you're in four dimensions, there are four values for mu. Okay, but, but my comment was that the degree of shift of flavor symmetry you discussed is actually kind of a, a vector, like vector global symmetry. Yes. Where you write a field transform depends on the coordinates, x, while the transformation- The this limit is, doesn't depend, depend on that. Right, okay. so that, that's a comment I was trying to make also earlier. So, so Xi mu, it's, so I'll, I'll have more to say about this later, actually. It, you know, eta mu is the analog of a gamma matrix. These Xi mu are analogs of uh, generators associated with the continuous symmetry. And, and what happens is when you go to this, when you make this transition to the staggered fermion, they pick up X dependence in the staggered action, but in the continuum limit, they're X independent. Oh, sorry, why? In a continuum? It, uh, um, in a continuum? Maybe we should, I mean, I have a, uh, we have to discuss the continuum later, and, and perhaps that's the time to discuss this more. Um, if that's okay with you. I mean, no, nothing I'm saying here is crucial to... You should, you should just go ahead. I, I just make 
question and you can yeah, yeah, yeah. arrange. I'm happy to chat. I just, you know, I, it would take us a long time to, uh, you know, it would be a, a lecture just on staggered fermions to fill in some of these gaps. Yeah. I think. But please go on, just take a control. It does co correspond to an ordinary uh, flavor symmetry in the continuum limit, X independent, not a gauge symmetry, if that's what you're worrying about. Uh, I know it's a, uh, we call it global symmetry, but I was just saying it's a vector like global symmetry. But anyway. Okay. That, yes. Vector -like. Okay. Vector -like. Mm -hmm. okay. So I, I talked about a massless theory with n flavors. And of course, I, what I want to do in the end is to um, introduce interactions. Um, and so the simplest, so the simplest model I can think of would have four flavors if I want to put in four fermion interactions. I have no choice but to have at least four flavors, right? I can't write the interaction down without that. So I'm thinking of an interaction which looks, for example, like chi one, chi two, chi three, chi four, just a product of the four fields, the four Grassmanns that you have available in four fields on a single site. It's the simplest interaction you can think of, right? And I can implement it through some sort of hubbard stratanovich transformation by coupling it to some auxiliary scalar field. And in this case, I choose this scalar field in the model I'm talking about right now uh, to transform basically under an SO3 subgroup um, of the, it's, it's a, of the SO4 symmetry that I'm imposing. So I have all flavors, so I have an SO4 symmetry. I can actually choose the auxiliary scalar just to transform under one of the SO3s. That's a choice I can make. And that's what choice that was made. I'm gonna show you a few numerical results associated with this. So I just wanna fill in that detail. Um, so the U1 we started with this, the one I just told you about is of course now breaking to Z, broken to Z4 in this model, corresponding to taking the fermions, transforming them according to this rule here. So I take chi to I epsilon chi and flip the sign of sigma. All right. So this is, this is just one way, one convenient way from the point of doing Monte Carlo uh, of implementing a four fermion term. This is the simplest four fermion model you can come up with. I've taken a reduced staggered fermion, which has a single component field of each lattice site, and I take products of four of them, right? And I just have a fully anti-symmetric version of that, which is implemented through the epsilon tensor when I square out, right? This, this is self-dual, so I get a chi A, chi B self-dual as a self-dual projection operator. I square it, and I'll just get the cross term, which looks like epsilon A, B, C, D, chi A, chi B, chi C, chi D, which is just the fancy version of this. All right, so this is the simplest model. This model was actually uh, first looked at by Shailesh Chandrasekharan. I don't know whether it's on the call in the context of uh, trying to construct models which had sign problems. Funnily enough, this model can be written down in a way which doesn't have a sign problem. <laughs> so he had algorithms simulating models without sign problems. We simulated this model actually with a regular uh, hybrid Monte Carlo because in fact, you can show that it doesn't have a sign problem if you choose this particular structure for your Yukawa interactions. That's historical at this point. But this is about the simplest model you can think of that involve reduced staggered fermions. It's about the simplest relativistic lattice model with four fermion interactions that were, you can think of. It's amazing it was never looked at before since it is the simplest thing you can do. Um, so it's easy to show that this four fermion guy condenses at large G so I can do a strong coupling expansion and I can just show this as non-zero and I can compute it leading order. I can think of this, interpret this, the appearance of this guy is more like the appearance of a bilinear mass term where I'm coupling one of my elementary fermions to a composite fermion built out of three more, right? So it's strong, if you want to have strong enough Yukawa interactions or strong enough uh, four fermion interactions, I can imagine binding three elementary fermions into one composite and then coupling it back to an elementary fermion. And so I can interpret the presence of this four fermion piece as corresponding to a gap symmetric phase. And so that, all right. So notice that I've given the, fer the this fermions mass, but there's, there's no symmetry breaking going on here at all. This condensate is completely symmetric and respects all the symmetries of the original action. Right, so, so I can argue at G, for G large, I get this gapped phase without, and then I, of course at G equals zero, I have a massless phase. So it has to be at least one phase transition between these two limits, right? As I, as I dial G from small to large values, I have to find at least one phase transition. And in fact, this model was studied by Shailesh and then later by us, uh, both in two, three, and four dimensions. Um, I won't talk about two dimensions, it's a bit more subtle, but Shailesh is the only one to work there. 
but it's certainly in three and even in four dimensions, this is four Euclidean dimensions, so three plus one if you want, there seems to, if you, uh, there seems to be a continuous, present, a continuous phase transition uh, between a massless and massive symmetric phase in this model. All right. In four dimensions, you actually have to you have to add a scalar kinetic term to and tune the coefficient of that. So it's in four in three dimensions, four fermion operator will do enough. In four dimensions, you need an additional uh, scalar kinetic operator. So it's more like a Higgs Yukawa couple a Higgs Yukawa model if, to to use a conventional uh, sort of particle physics terminology. All right. So I'm going to show you in just a second some evidence for this. But anyway, the idea is that this interaction for sufficiently large G can gap all the fermions. And because you have a continuous phase transition, you have the option of building a massive vector-like continuum theory where you've broken no symmetry. So this is an example where you can generate mass in a relativistic theory um, without breaking any symmetries. So it's different from the usual conventional picture. And in fact, if you look in at the critical exponents in three dimensions, they are, they are novel. So Shailesh has pushed, I think, his simulations up to something like 60 cubed or even maybe bigger at this point, I don't know. So they have pretty good scaling and pretty good critical exponents in three dimensions for that model. Four dimensions, the lattices are somewhat smaller, of course, um, and the less has been done, but there seems to be, I'll show you a sec in a second, there's some evidence for a phase transition, continuous phase transition. So uh, here are a couple of plots. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Sorry. Uh, the question about the the interaction term that uh, was uh, uh -huh. introduced. So uh, here we are trying to say uh, gap the gap the fermions. Yep. Uh, sorry. Actually, let me just make sure. Do we still have a do we do we start from a vector like theory? Right now, we are trying to get a chiral theory. At the moment, I'm not doing a chiral theory. So this is a okay. warm up. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I'll show you in a second. Oh, well. I'll... I've already stated it, I think, that this thing does not going, is not going to give me a chiral theory. It will gap all the fermions. I see. So it's a vector theory, and you want to gap all things. So, but so this not, is where we by... were, two or three years ago, we were working with vector-like theories and trying to gap all the fermions without breaking symmetries. And so okay. this is an example of a kind of picture you can get. So here is the fourth, essentially a proxy for the four fermion condensators, a function of G. Just look at, this is in four dimensions directly. You can just look at the, say, the blue curve. Kappa is some coupling to the scalar kinetic term, so don't worry too much about that. Just look at blue. It's, the four fermion condensate is not an order parameter, right? It's always non-zero, but you can see it switches on very rapidly around g of one. All right, so that's the blue curve here. Correspondingly, there's a certain fermionic susceptibility you can measure, and you get a nice peak in the same vicinity. All right, these are different lattices now. This is six, six to the fourth, eight to the fourth, and twelve to the fourth. This is all done with a rational hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm where you simulate the Fafian directly, or it's actually it's possible to prove there's no sign problem in this model. I don't have time to go into that, but this is a perfectly concrete uh, construction. If you don't tune the scalar kinetic term, you can find ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic ordered phases as well. So you have to, it's more complicated in four dimensions to find a direct phase transition, but we have evidence of one. Okay, so this is from an um, earlier... About. Question: uh, Is it known if the critical point has Lorentz invariance? No, it is not known, and in, indeed, it's not even clear it would, because the proofs that these staggered fermions are Lorentz invariant are weak coupling proofs, typically in an asymptotically free gauge theory. So, when you right. have strongly coupled fermions like this, it is not at all clear that Lorentz invariance is restored. That's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. You might be worried that this is really a phase transition, by the way, because these peaks, this peak is saturating as you increase the lattice size. It's not scaling up with, with volume. But actually, in fact, the correlation length, I don't have a plot of it, uh, is increasing very rapidly in this transition. In fact, this is, uh, it's, it's very, very hard to even compute around the peak uh, because, it's, uh, because of critical slowing down. So although this particular susceptibility saturates there's strong evidence of a divergent correlation length here. Can I ask a question? Sure. I, oh, I, I missed the first five minutes of your talk because I was giving a talk. So I, I apologize. You, you may have already said this. The, the symmetry G is SO4 in this case? In this case, yes. Um, and, yes. And if I go to the continuum limit in three and four dimensions, when I've just got the massless fermions, what, what, what do I find there? You mean if, if I set G to zero? I think 
So I think so, yeah. But if I just have the massless fermions before they get gapped, what, what are they in those two dimensions? Oh, oh in, in, in four dimensions, you get, uh, from this theory, you'll have two Dirac fermions. Or four Myron, or if you want. Four Myron, I see. And, four and Myron is a better way to think about it, perhaps. Yeah, and the same in three, four Myron. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, thanks. That's right. All right. Simon, another question. It's related to what I was asking. So, so you want to preset SO four symmetry, mm -hmm. and you write down some um, coupling between fermions and effective a sigma field, right? And integral sigma field to generate sure. full fermion. Right. So, I was wondering, say, how do you know full fermion interaction is the correct way? And let me com complete my statement, yeah. because uh, in priori we don't really know what are the interaction terms to write down. But uh, for example, in some of uh, probably your understanding, you might say that. Uh, most of things are related to Fedosky Kitaf, which is full fermion interaction. But a lot of work like I did with the one uh, Xiaogang is essentially not the full fermion interaction. It could be multi fermions, uh -huh. right? And there's a way of principle design. And also in comparison, like uh, what David Tong was talking uh, last time, he actually has, I, I suppose, like a super symmetrized field. And there are three, three fields, super potential with the three fermions, or maybe uh, the super, super scatter, they couple together, they are three, three fermions. So it's not uh, obvious that uh, why the full fermion interaction works. No, is, there I, some I, reason, is there some reason you, you design this? It's the simplest way I know to put an interaction in, that's all. And in fact, in four dimensions, it's not really a full fermion interaction. It's crucial that you have a kinetic term for the scalar two, or else you won't find a direct phase transition between a massless and massive phase. So you shouldn't even really think of it as pure full fermi in four dimensions. Right. So I'm gonna focus more on writing down a Yukawa interaction and hoping that does the job, but it won't be strictly in four dimensions, at least uh, four fermion interaction. But I absolutely agree. You could try, you could do other things. Four fermion is the first one up after a bilinear term. That's all. I'm, and, and it's simply the one that I can borrow directly from uh, um, Kiteyev and people, right? But, but, but let me make sure. But, but I, I don't have a strong reason. If in fact I change the structure of the multi fermion action, I also change some of the symmetries later I'm going to talk about. Sorry, so so is the numeric you show here is also it's just full fermion interaction or uh, actually no, are, it's uh, not. It's as it, as you oh. see, it says need to add kinetic term for sigma. I see. Okay, that's the kappa coefficient. So if you put kappa to zero, which is pure full fermi, then it looks like you have a very similar picture. If you look at the picture on the left, but if you look very carefully, and this was done by Shailish originally, uh, you'll see there's an incredibly narrow symmetry broken phase between the massless and massive symmetric phases. It's so narrow, you can't even see two phase transitions. You see one big phase transition, so it looks like you have one transition. But if you look at how that scales carefully, you'll see that, in fact, there's a small bilinear broken phase in the middle. And it's only when you increase kappa slightly that you can tune that uh, broken phase away. Um, there's so a I, I should give you a reference to my paper here, but I don't have it. <laughs> there's a question from uh, Yenis Tisakakis. Tizilikakis, sorry, do you want to ask? He asked about yeah. computational, is that more evolved if we include additional and other interaction terms? There's a chat question in the chat, question in the chat. So, so say again, does it include, uh, all we did was- um, Maybe more computational scalar kinetic terms. Way be more computational. If I a sigma fourth in as well, in principle. If, if you add more terms, how how would be the the complexity of the simulation? Like uh, that wouldn't go up much. That would be the same. Wouldn't. It's just an expanded phase diagram because now you have more couplings to navigate around in. But the the hard thing is the fermion operator, as always for lattice gauge theory. That isn't changing. That's determined by the Yukawa interaction. Uh, and that we can prove is has is free of side problems. And if you add more uh, derivatives in sigma or more powers of sigma, it, that's that's the easy part of the calculation. That that go you know, complicates the phase diagram, but it's not computationally harder. And in fact, it, it might be interesting to do it because um, you'll probably find a lot of different phases. This thing has you know th four or five different phases, and we just we've tuned kappa, so we hit we go between the two we're interested in here. I mean, I, is that clear? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I don't want to spend too much time on here because as Yuvan has already pointed out, this is not even going to target any kind of chiral theory. This is meant to be motivation that reduced agrofermions can be gapped. We have good evidence of symmetric mass generation in, in vector-like versions of these theories. That's all I want to say. Right, that's, that's, so I, I, gosh, what time is it? <laughs> all right. You have 40 minutes more and you can yeah, take- Yeah, we're gonna need it. <laughs> that's <laughs> fine. I don't mind not getting to the end. That's fine. As long as we cover, get a little bit further along. Okay, so I'll go on. All right, so, so the previous model, that one I just talked about, uses four fermion or in general, you count interactions to generate masses for the entire reduced staggered field, both chi minus and chi plus, and, and yields a vector-like new theory, theory given in terms of Dirac fermions. But it's the obvious question you might ask is, suppose I just put the interactions on say even parity sites, what would that give me? All right, so I can imagine to be more specific, let me write down some sort of generalized Yukawa interaction between two of my chi's, right? Uh, again, let me just think of four Fermi interactions, but I might in four dimensions need more than that in the end, but let's just concentrate on the Yukawa structure. Um, clearly these gammas here have to be anti-symmetric matrices because of the chi's are, I don't know, because of Grassmann, nature of chi's. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of some general number of scalar fields, sigma A here. But the important thing is this thing in front of it. So P plus and P minus are these projectors on even and odd lattice sites. So I'm, what I'm thinking of at the back of my mind is I wanna take capital G very big and try to gap out the even parity sites and take little g towards zero um, to, to leave the, if you want, the odd sites weakly interacting or not interacting at all in the limit, all right? The reason I have little g at all is otherwise I have a shift symmetry in my action and I will have a zero mode and I have to handle that numerically one way or another anyway. So I, I just imagine a little g in there just to regulate the zero mode if nothing else. And I'm gonna think of two n flavors. So I'm not going to tell you how many flavors yet I need, but they're gonna to have to transform in some real representation of some orthogonal symmetry, some SOM say. So M would be uh, the number of scalar fields I need. Um, in practice, this structure is really borrowed from uh, uh, Fitkovsky and Kateyev. In a sense, I'm gonna take these gammas actually to be Dirac gamma matrices associated with that SO7, uh, SOM symmetry, all right? And one way you can justify that structure is that if I take these to be ga Dirac gammas, and then I just take the sigmas all to be constants, then this will give me sort of degenerate Majorana masses terms for the, Majorana-like mass terms for the staggered fermions. So, so I'm sort of sneaky here and I'm borrowing the structure pretty carefully from uh, Kitea et al. But I'm leaving then, at the moment I'm gonna to sh sort of expose the anomaly down the line, I'm gonna leave N open at this point, all right? So clearly if I integrate the sigmas out, I get a four fermion interaction. And in fact, it has that particular form. Uh, and that comes, uh, that's not exactly how they wrote it down originally, but it's the way, for example, described in Chenkashu's paper um, a few years later. So this particular structure involving direct gamma matrices. So, that, so we took it really from his paper in, in some sense. Um, so, okay, so let's get back to this question. What happens if I gap the chi plus fermions? Can I gap the chi plus fermions and leave the chi minus uh, massless? So that would mean I'd removed another factor of two in my fermions. Right, I went from staggered to reduced staggered. That took me down from four Dirac to four Majorana. I'm saying, suppose I can gap out half of those again using some sort of appropriate Yukawa interaction. That will get me down to something with more like two Majorana fermions, all right? Naively, let's see. Um, but what is the continuum theory? You have to look at that. And what are the constraints on this structure? Right? Uh, what, is, what is N? What N does N have to be in order to make this work? So. So to understand what the constraints are, um, you, you need to uh, uh, uncover a potential anomaly for staggered fermions, which is not visible on the lattice with the topology of a torus. And this confused me for a long time because I couldn't understand where the anomaly was coming from. Uh, and so what we have to do for a moment to just to justify what's what we'll need for this interaction in the end is we have to generalize staggered fermions off the torus and off the hypercubic lattice to a general simplicial complex or a triangulation if you want. And in fact, 
although staggered fermions are usually obtained by spin diagonalizing a naive fermion, a naive Dirac fermion, I personally believe that they're best thought of as a discretization of what are called Kähler Dirac fermions. And so we have to come up with a lattice version of the Kähler Dirac equation that will generalize to an arbitrary triangulation. All of that will be able to identify a particular U1 symmetry, which will be anomalous depending on the topology of the lattice. So that's what we're, that's what we're shooting for. So this Kähler Dirac equation is effectively an alternative to the Dirac equation. I mean, in the locally flat backgrounds, it just describes two to the D over two degenerate spinners. In fact, that's the multiplicity associated with staggered fermions. Staggered fermions are a particular discretization of this Kähler Dirac equation. That's the way you should think about them. So actually their symmetries are not are naively not quite Lorentz symmetry times flavor symmetry, but a twisted version of them. And they only enhance to those symmetries if the background is appropriately flat. So what is this Kähler Dirac equation? It's written down in terms of the exterior derivative and its adjoint. So you simply write D minus D dagger, that's an anti-symmetric or anti-emission operator, acting on some collection of forms equals zero. That would be the massless Kähler Dirac equation. You can see that this is not a crazy equation to write down for fermions because clearly when I square K, I get the Laplacian, right? Because D squared is zero and D dagger squared is zero. So if you're Dirac, you could have actually, and you known differential geometry, you could actually have not discovered the Dirac equation, but you could have discovered the Kähler Dirac equation, which was actually discovered, I think, in the 60s or something like that. All right. So this omega is a collection of forms, and this is a derivative that acts on it. Um, and this is what we have to have uh, constructed a, a lattice version of this. All right. So um, let me just say a little bit more on Kähler before I do that. Um, so this collection of forms here, um, omega zero to omega d. I can use them to build a matrix by just taking products of gamma matrices and contract and the num the gamma matrices I need are, con are connected to the index structure on the form, right? So I can just build a four by four matrix in four dimensions out of my forms in here by contracting them with products of gamma matrices. And I can show this Kähler Dirac equation is equivalent to D slash on epsi equals zero. So there is a connection back to Dirac this psi, though, is not a spinner. It's a four by four matrix. And in fact, you can see it's exactly four copies of the Dirac equation where the Dirac spinners correspond to columns of psi. All right, so this is, again, all well known. This is not particularly new. It's perhaps not familiar to a lot of lattice gauge theorists, but it's it, it's not. It, it was discovered in the fairly early days of lattice gauge theory and then just sort of fell to the side. So, um, so I can... So there is an intimate connection between the Kähler Dirac equation and the Dirac equation, such that in flat space, at least, they're just, you just get four copies. And it's precisely those four copies you associate with staggered fermions, because staggered fermions will turn out to be a, a, a true, a, 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 just a discretization of the Kähler Dirac equation. Right? I can think about the analog of a reduced staggered fermion by saying a, a reduced Dirac Kähler field. That just means I take these forms to be real, not complex, roughly speaking. And that implies a reality condition on this four by four matrix psi. So psi dagger is related to psi transpose. All right, and we'll need a couple of these results later on, actually. This is just an aside, but I have to tell you about how you do this for discrete systems. So what you happens is that you replace the staggered fermions by discrete Kata Dirac fermions. So I take the 16 staggered fields in a unit hypercube. So I take a unit, I take those 16 fields and I map them into these, these six, these uh, 16 anti-symmetric tensor fields that need to fill out omega, right? And I'm gonna associate those with, so a, a particular um, P form here gets associated with a, a P simplex in the lattice. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping of those continuum forms into P dimensional simplices in, in a general triangulation, of, right? A general lattice. And you replace the staggered operator by a discrete analog of the Kähler Dirac operator which is built out of boundary and co-boundary operators, which, which are the analogs of D and D dagger, and they act naturally on the simplices in the lattice. So for example, if I take the delta, the boundary of a P simplex, I get all the boundary P minus one simplices weighted by a sign, which is the orientation, sort of the order that they're contained inside the, the P simplex. Um, and I just, I can then write down a discrete Kähler Dirac equation, which is delta minus delta bar on, on a lattice omega equals zero. 
And if I do this on a regular hypercubic lattice with the topology of a torus, and I choose my lattice appropriately, this just gives me back the staggered action, right? So this fancy geometric language just gives me what I showed you before, if you want restricted to the torus on a regular sort of cubic lattice. But the difference is that I can write this down on any oriented random triangulation with any topology, right? And it, it's, it corresponds, if you want, to a generalization of staggered fermions to lattices with more general topologies than the torus. And that's where we'll see the anomaly arising. Okay, and what's actually kind of cute about all of this, besides the fact that there's such a close compare analog between lattice and continuum here, there's a D's go to boundary operators and things like that. And it turns out that when you replace the continuum equation by the lattice equation, there's no fermion doubling comes in. You can show the solutions of the lattice equation converge uniformly to the solutions in the continuum. There is no additional doubling arises at that point, right? Now you don't describe a single fermion, right? I mean, that's true in the continuum just as it is on the lattice. So in, in both cases, if you want to decompose it into spinners, you're going to get more than one spinner, right? It's, so it's not, if you want, the minimal way of describing an electron is not with a Kähler Dirac field, you'll get four, right, in four dimensions. So what happens to the Nielsen Inamia theorem in that case? Is it still? No, it's fine because these are left and right. Oh. It's just like staggered. It will describe the rack like there is. Okay. So if I decompose it in the spinners, I get an equal number of left and right. Yeah. There's a lot of, I could, again, I could give a seminar just on this mapping between the, into the discrete Kähler Dirac operator, but I just want to rapidly move on to motivate the anomaly here. So, all you have to be aware of is that there is a sort of generalization of staggered fermions, which is extremely natural and works on any random triangulation with any topology and just sim simply reduces staggered fermions basically on the on a torus with cubic with a cubic lattice, a regular cubic lattice. But uh, as you see, most of the structure of staggered fermions now lifts into this Kähler Dirac theory. So for this example, a nice interpretation of this gauge field eta mu in terms of this Kähler Dirac language. Yes, so the staggered fermion phases are basically um, become plus or minus signs associated with these um, D and D dagger. The fact you're using exterior, exterior derivatives, right, means you're anti symmetrizing all the time. And those phases arise directly from that anti symmetrization. Again, if we had a blackboard in half an hour, I could show it works, how it works explicitly in two dimensions. And this is all, this is not new, this is all well known at least to amongst a certain small subset of lattice people. Um, but that's where they're coming from. They're coming from anti-symmetrization uh, associated with the exterior derivative acting on anti-symmetric forms. Thanks. Okay, so there's one other cute thing that's really crucial. So I talked about the lattice killer Dirac fermions, but they, there's this operator gamma I can write down, which simply flips the sign of the form. So gamma acting on some form omega p just changes the sign according to whether p is odd or even, an odd or even form. It's very easy to show that this gamma anti-commutes with the lattice Kähler Dirac operator on any triangulation, right? So it generates a U1 symmetry, right? I can just exponentiate I alpha gamma. And now I can, for the massless theory, I have an exact U1 symmetry for the lattice Kähler Dirac operator on an arbitrary triangulation. In fact, it's precisely this e to the i alpha epsilon symmetry we met for staggered fermions. So the analog of site parity here, right, is this linear operator gamma, which just flips the sign of the form. And that form can be on the lattice. So I can take the field living on a particular triangle or a particular link and flip it according to whether it's, you know, if it's a link, it flips sign. If it's a triangle, it doesn't flip sign. Right. So, so there's an exact symmetry of the massless Lattice Kähler Dirac action, this generalization of staggered fermions, which holds on any random triangulation. So that's a classical symmetry. Of course, you have to worry about anomalies in the fermion measure. And you can ima imagine that the fermion measure involves basically integrating over all the forms throughout the lattice. So I have n0 points, n1 links, n4 four simplices, for example. I should integrate over all of those Right? And then when I imagine doing this symmetry transformation, 
what will happen is that I'll pick up a phase from each of these sectors. And if you follow it through just for a second, you'll see that in general, this phase um, count, uh, is associated with the Euler character of the triangulation. So I have N zero uh, plus alpha phases minus N one contributions from the link integration plus N two, et cetera. So it, it gives you precisely chi, right? So in general, you learn there is an anomaly for this system, um, which depends on the Euler characteristic of the triangulation. So I could have done this calculation in the continuum and I would have gotten the same answer. So this is an example where the anomaly is captured exactly by the lattice theory, which is kind of remarkable in itself or acute or whatever, you know. And in fact, we noticed this a few years ago in a totally different context. I only realized recently how to fit it into this picture. Um, so uh, we were thinking more about quantum gravity and things like this and regulated as triangulations. Uh, but but this, is a, this is a fact, right? Can so, I ask a question, yeah. Simon? Sure. The, this is just a normal gravitational anomaly where if I, if I do U1, U1 rotation, I get an R wedge R term coming up in, I th in the I think if you were to regulate it uh, in the continuum, I mean, that's precisely what you get, right? You'd have to have, you'd put a spin connection in, in the continuum, which you could do here too. And you'd have to regulate the, you know, the analog of psi bar d psi psi just like you do for Fujikawa. I haven't done it, but I suspect it goes through the same way, but it's actually much easier to do it on the lattice, <laughs> right? It just, it's just a counting exercise on the lattice, but you're right, it's a gravitational anomaly. But my, my question is that I, I would imagine that the, the Kähler Dirac forms experience see this anomaly differently from, from actual spinners. They must do because which are, which are, the zero mode structure is different. Mm, in, I see, yeah, that, that's, that, that's a giveaway. There are harmonic forms, right? The zero modes. So, so there are global differences between Kähler Dirac and Dirac. That's clear, and that's actually important, and that's relevant for Snagger too. You see. Okay. Very good. Thanks. So you see, but you can see that if you're on the torus, chi is zero, and this anomaly goes away. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's only visible. In fact, so what? So the constraint I've been using is the following. Let me go to the sphere, right? Because that I can think of that as some sort of compactification of R four with chi equals two. And so then this Z will transform by this phase factor for N flavors, right? Just think of them initially as, you know, free, free fermions even, right? And so it's in, so what happens is the U1 symmetry breaks, you know, to a Z symmetry. And if I need to incorporate four fermion interactions, the minimum N I have is four. I can't do it with less than four. So if I want to have four fermion interactions for these Lattice Kähler Dirac fields propagating around on some funny, uh, some spherical topology. Um, then I see that the anomaly will cancel actually under a Z8 transformation. And otherwise, I can rotate the fermions by e to the i, this gamma operator times pi over four, and powers of that. All right, so that's going to be the ingredient I'm going to use to try to constrain my Yukawa interactions back on the torus. I'm going to require that they also satisfy this anomaly condition. So what I'm trying to do here is generate kind of a poor man's version of uh, these discrete anomaly cancellation conditions that are talked of in the continuum. I'm trying to understand how that would work in the context of staggered fermions, basically, which in this case becomes Kähler Dirac fermions. And, and there is this exact anomaly which you can find even on the lattice and there's no corrections. It's just, it is what it is. Um, and in fact, the calculation of the anomaly is easier on the lattice. As you can see, it's just counting simplices. Um, can I ask another question? Yeah. Sure. Why go to the sphere where you find a Z8 and then use that to constrain the things on the torus? If you'd gone to a K3, for example, you would have found something different from Z8. Absolutely. And then I don't know. I don't understand. I'm picking S4 because I think it's closest to you know the real world R4. But I agree that I could have picked a different topology and got a different answer. And I don't know how to explain that or deal with that. Awesome. Can I make sure this is what I need to get back to eight um, to the spin seven interaction of Kitayev et al. If you want the, answer, the honest answer, right? It's one way to see how that arises, I think. Yes, I have a question. Matt. Sure. So if I take into account like in the continuum, the, the, the rotational symmetry, mm -hmm. I say it will be the spin D 
gradial SO, spatial rotation. Yeah. Spin Mostly I'm thinking of spin, not SO right. really. Right, yeah. so, so, so then let me just make sure that what's the full symmetry, including space time, spin D and internal symmetry that here you care about some ZA, right? So should we be spin D, uh, D where is D equal to four, let's say four dimensional space time times uh -huh. ZA and model the common Z2 symmetry? Is that a symmetry you are uh, talking about? Space time, you know? Spin times ZA model the common Z2 for non parity. Well, in the continuum limit, there'll be another spin D coming from the fact that each reduced staggered field dis um, inherits a, um, a spin D symmetry as well, which is the original kind of internal flavor symmetry. Uh, so it's a bit more complicated. But, but, but okay, I, I just want to identify what exactly is the anomaly class you have. I, uh, which means the classification. I don't know is the answer. I'm uh, I'm ignorant. Let me let me not <laughs> say it any other way. So you tell me later when we get to the end what what that classification is. My my comment is that uh, if I have a Z four symmetry instead of Z eight, then there is a Z sixteen classification. I think David Tom and others so like so looking. What I'm no going to argue is that this gives me sixteen Majorana fermions in the flat space limit in the continuum. From this Z8, okay. once I've gapped appropriately. But 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 my comment is that if the symmetry Z8 and if the fermion carry minimum charge one in the Z8, I, I suppose actually you require 32 fermions. The anomaly is a Z32 class instead of Z6. Uh, for the full field, that will be true. But once I remove half the degrees of freedom, I think it drops. Uh, I'll, you'll see in a second. I'm going to explicitly talk about this. So we maybe should Thanks. postpone the discussion to then. Okay, so let's go back to the torus. And, and look at our fermion operator again. Here's the this lattice version of it. So let me look at an eigenvalue equation for that um, fermion operator. And let me now demand that this uh, theory is invariant under the Z8 I just showed you. All right. All right. So in other words, I should be able to take my uh, eigenvectors and multiply them by omega or omega to the minus one in this case, do some rotation on the sigmas and end up reproducing an eigenvalue equation with a shifted eigenvalue. So you can very easily verify with this structure of M that it satisfies this relation. And right? there's what happens is the eigenvalue shift by some phase omega squared under sigma goes to omega squared sigma, right? So if I was naive about this, I'd say if I shift all my eigenvalues by a constant phase and there are at least four of them, groups of four, then the Fafin that I get from integrating out the fermions is naively invariant. However, of course, that's way too naive. If I have zero modes, which I certainly do on the torus, I have to worry about the contribution of zero modes to the um, Fafian under this rotation, under this Z8 rotation. So let's look at it in more detail. Suppose I fix the configuration just for reference to one. So all the sigmas are set to one. And for the moment, just even let me two, take the two couplings to be the same because it's illustrative. Um, so changing the phase of sigma by omega squared is just like rotating what, these couplings by some factor e to the i epsilon times pi over two. So I can always do an S, an anomalous and SO2 and rotation to bring the interaction term to this sort of canonical, you know, block diagonal uh, form where these block elements are basically uh, uh, these projectors times their associated couplings. And so what happens is if I just look at the contribution of the would-be zero modes, right? Um, I have to take the product over all the zero modes. I have a phase factor e to the i epsilon pi over two for each two by two block on the diagonal and they're n blocks because I started off with two n flavors. And so I get a factor like this in front of the Fafian when I do one of these rotations. And so obviously if I have, if both chi plus and chi minus are in the game, and they both have opposite values of epsilon, the phase just cancels out trivially. So in the vector-like theory, there is no anomaly. But suppose I'm successful in removing the chi pluses above the cutoff, so they no, no longer contribute to the, to the zero mode structure. Then I would just be taking this product over say just the epsilon equals minus one states, right? And so then I get a constraint because then this phase factor, I want to be one, right? If it's not one, uh, then uh, the, then the Fafian's not invariant, and that would be a problem because I'm integrating over sigma two. So that would lead to a partition function, which was probably vanishing because I'd be integrating over a phase. So the anomaly sort of is manifest again, and clearly I can cancel that anomaly out 
if I've managed if I've managed to decouple chi plus and chi minus, so I'm looking only at chi minus, for example, I need a multi, I need at least eight reduced staggered fermion fields to cancel out this phase. So this is a formal argument, right? I'm not actually doing the gapping and I'm not, but I'm just saying, suppose I'm successful in gapping it out and suppose that, that effectively removes the epsilon equals plus one states from the lower end of the spectrum. Then I only have states with a fixed epsilon equals minus one. Then I need, then the fact that the Fafian has to, should be invariant under this Z8 rotation gives me a constraint on the number of flavors, which of course tells me that I need eight reduced second fermions. So that's going to be close to justifying the um, FK interaction. Excuse me, I have a question here. Sure. Uh, why the gap of the sector have no contribution under this Z8 rotation? I think you have assumption. Once that sector is a gap, it has uh, no, you're, no contribution on this Z8 rotation. Yeah, I have, to really, I, have to, I have to really put them above the cutoff so they no longer contribute, right? It's a subtle business because this phase doesn't depend on the magnitude of the coupling constant, right? Yeah. So what you're saying is, yes, they're still technically paired, even the, with the gap states, and that's sort of true. So that's why I say the argument is sort of formal. I have to actually come up with a real calculation which shows that those, those chi plus states are really decoupled from the physics of low energies. I, and this is a, this is a sort of, a, again, a kind of poor man's argument as to how this might work. Right. Why is it that staggered fermions might be important for this for, to affect this symmetric mass generation? I'm saying that they have the sort of structure when you in, inject this sort of anomaly, which which suggests that that the sort of FK type interaction will, will might do the trick because it matches the fermion counting. Basically, the number of fermions you would need to naively cancel off this effect from just the low modes um, is is what you what you would inherit from the FK interaction, right? So so this turning. Let me just say it another way. I won't be able to generate mass for chi plus and decouple from chi minus in the continuum limit unless I've cancelled off the anomaly in both sectors separately. So in the light sector specifically. So the minimal model I can conceive of, I need eight fermions. So they have to be an eight dimensional. It has to be a real representation of some group. And sort of the simplest in quotes solution is the spin seven um, FK interaction, right? It satisfies all the criteria that I can see might be relevant for my reduced staggered fermion construction, right? And to get back to Yuvan's comment from before, I'm gonna show you in a few moments that once if I just focus on the light degrees of freedom, so I'm assuming I have been successful in gapping out chi plus, then the resultant theory will describe two Majorana fermions in the continuum limit, but I have eight copies of that. So I end up with 16 Majorana or vial fermions if they're massless in the continuum limit. So the counting does agree with the conventional counting that this theory should, this, the, uh, this anomaly, if you want, will only cancel out for 16 Bile fermions in four dimensions. Let me make sure the ZA symmetry X on the 16 bile fermions, all the bile fermions has a ZA charge, charge one, or um, what's the charge of a Z8 for the bile fermions? I think they're charge one. Charge one. Yeah. I mean, I, well, you, you just want to know what the omega factor is, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. So one in, one in eight. That's how it acts on the fermion. It, it looks to me the anomaly seems to be 32. I mean, there's the classification is 32. If it's a charge one, I think. If I count chi plus and chi minus, that's true. If I can remove the, if I can effectively put the chi plus above the cutoff so they're no longer in the physical theory. Right, but, 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 but I admit. But, yes, but, but as you say, you, you say that uh, both the light sector, the gap sector, and also the gap sector should be both anomaly free, and which I also, which I agree. Okay. So, so then one should, one should possibly... So maybe, maybe what you're saying is, I agree with it then maybe. No. There are 32 fermions, but only 16 light ones. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, so, so that's a slight puzzle from the theoretical side from the anomaly classification from Cobaltism. If I interpret the, the group correctly, um, maybe I mis misunderstood the group. We can discuss later, but I say if the symmetry is Z8, 
if that the the Z A shear was the spin rotational group by the Fermion parity Z two, I think the class requires thirty two fermions. If the fermions has charge one on the Z eight, that's a puzzle. I, I was not sure. Maybe I misunderstood some part. We should, we should talk later because I mean, yeah, was, no problem. as David pointed out before, I picked the sphere and I could have picked some other topology other other than the torus. Yeah, sure. Thanks. There's, there, there's yeah. quite a bit of dependence on that choice as well in all of this. Okay, let me move on. Let me. So I'm going to boldly show you a few uh, very preliminary numerical results, which are at least vaguely consistent with things working, but we'll see. So for the start, I, I, I'm, I'm going to just restrict myself to three dimensions, so I don't have to worry about scalar kinetic terms. I can just use the four Fermi interaction. So this is not going to give me a chiral theory. I'm in three dimensions only. Um, it's very easy, by the way, to rescale the, these staggered fields and show that the classical equations, once I've integrated out the scalar for these two sectors, chi plus and chi minus, satisfy this pair of equations where mu is the ratio of these couplings. So clearly the chi minus guy, if mu is going to zero, is weakly, it's a weakly coupled sector and becomes massless in the limit mu goes to zero, whereas the chi plus guys are strongly coupled, right? And you can sort of see an effect of that in the, if you measure the four fermion, the VEV of the four fermion operator on even an odd sites, this is a logarithmic plot. For one is basically flat, that's the one associated with little g, and I'm scaling here only in big G, so I'm just cranking up the that four fermi coupling, and you can see this sort of four orders of magnitude between the two different VEVs on the even sites and on the odd sites. So the odd parity sector is really coupled, the even parity sector is strongly coupled. So that's one nice feature that's at least I can show asymmetric gapping of or asymmetric condensates at least which is at least one requirement I would need from the numerics by the way there's no sign problem at this values of the couplings we check that explicitly on at least on small lattices and it shows no sign I mean it's like literally no sign problem if I go to very strong coupling st the story is different I think there will be a sign problem there but right now on what I'm showing you there is no sign problem What's more interesting is to look in more detail at the spectrum of the fermion operator. So what I can do is I can just plot, eigen, on the left-hand plot, I'm plotting the eigenvalue on the x-axis and this thing I called expectation value of epsilon on the y. So what is that? Is I take every eigenvector, so I diagonalize my matrix or whatever into eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So these are discrete lattice valued things. And I simply take you know, the matrix element of epsilon on each eigenvector, and I'm plotting that number as a function of eigenvalue here. So what do you notice? You notice that this thing goes to minus one, um, you know, for small eigenvalues, and it goes to plus one for large eigenvalues. That is consistent with the idea that the epsilon equals plus one states are pushed up towards the cutoff, and the epsilon of minus one states sit down at low eigenvalue. What's more, you can even see in this plot, which is a single configuration on just a four cube lattice. So, you know, it's a very tiny lattice, but you know, whatever. Uh, and you know, my little g is 0 0.01 here and my big G was five. Um, but you can sort of see that the eigenvalues are also clustering in these two limits. And in fact, if you look at a histogram of the eigenvalues, now I'm a histogram of epsilon, basically. You see most of the states are either plus one or minus one. So the majority of the, minus one states are down here. The majority of the epsilon equals plus one states here. And there aren't that many states in the middle region. And in this case, I even looked at the histogram for six cubed. I've actually done this for six cubed too. I just don't show the plot because it starts getting messy. So at least on these small lattices in three dimensions, most modes are being pushed to epsilon of plus or minus one as G goes to infinity. And in fact, what happens is if G is small, this separation of the modes doesn't happen. So what happens is you increase G, you develop these two peaks and they move away from each other and become like delta functions on epsilon of plus or minus one as this strong coupling gets bigger, right? So this is at least consistent with the picture I was hoping for where the epsilon equals plus one states up at the cutoff, the epsilon is minus one states, right? The, the, the weakly coupled free sector, if you want, live down close to the origin, right? This is a, this is, by the way, this is symmetric because 
you're taking the spectrum of an anti-symmetric operator. So for every lambda, there's a minus lambda. That's why it's symmetric. So, so this is very preliminary and may go wrong. And I don't know how it looks on bigger lattices. And it's going to be hard to compute things like this on big lattices because I have to get the entire spectrum. So numerically, that's harder. But at least on small lattices, that looks OK. Um, any questions about that? All right. What time is it? I bet I'm close to running out of time. Wow. Uh, OK, well, I haven't got too many slides left, actually. So one of the other key things that I wanted to check, of course, that there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking here. So what I'm doing here is looking at a couple of different possible condensates, right? The action doesn't allow you to write fermion bilinears down, but you could still get spontaneous symmetry breaking in the formation of condensates in principle. So the way you would test for that is you would add an external source that breaks the symmetry to the action in the usual way. Then you drive the source to zero and you ask what the volume dependence is of the VEV. If there's no volume dependence, there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking. In a model which has spontaneous symmetry breaking, you will find as you take the external driving source to zero, there'll be a strong volume dependence that sets up such that as you take the volume to infinity, there's a non-zero VEB that survives basically sending the source to zero. So what you see here, and these are now getting bigger, this is eight cubed and 16, 16 cubed. This is the site condensate, basically the VEB of that operator. Um, and you see no volume dependence visible at all, it looks like it's going smoothly to zero as I take the source to zero. This is a, this is an interesting operator. This couples left even on odd sites, so that's precisely an operator you don't want to condense because that would couple left and right modes in the end. And again, it's a similar picture. We're not seeing any real volume dependence at all um, in either of these two guys. As I go, as I switch off the source, it goes uniformly to zero. There's no sign of a strong volume dependence at small source. So this is consistent with the absence of symmetry breaking via bilinear condensates, which is one of the criteria you wanted to be true for any of this to work. Um, okay. Um, uh, is there any questions about this? Uh, so I, I wouldn't stake my life on any of this stuff. It's literally only a week or two ago that I, we produced any of these plots. This is partly work with my student now, um, but uh, it, it's sort of encouraging and I mean, one has to go to bigger lattices and go particularly to four dimensions to see if the same picture holds up. And that will be a much bigger calculation, particularly because I have to explore the phase structure and the things like that. But um, it, it's at least mildly encouraging that numerics doesn't look terrible so far. Uh, I haven't yet told you what the continuum limit is. Um, so I should try to do that at least before I finish. Um, so I, I can take my, the way I would construct this continuum limit for staggered fermions is I take my staggered fields in the hypercube and I take products with, I take, I can use them to, with products of gamma matrices to construct again a four by four matrix. If this sounds like the Keller Dirac prescription, it is. It's basically the very, very similar construction. So this is called going to spin taste basis in lattice gauge theory. But it's basically telling you how to construct the Keller Dirac four by four matrix out of my staggered fields. The staggered fields look like those anti symmetric tensors, they're the components that you multiply by gamma matrices to get to this. If I go to Euclidean chiral basis, it's very easy to see that this matrix has a block structure where down the diagonal are the even side fields. And on the off diagonals, those are the odd, uh, if you want the, the, the chi minus fields. All right. Now, if I, so I now have to think about the continuum limit. So naively in the continuum limit, I inherit the spin four Lorentz symmetry. And then there's also a spin four flavor symmetry, which just corresponds to the fact I was rotating four Majorana fields into each other. So there's a spin four flavor in, intrinsic to the, if you want, to the reduced staggered fermion or to the Kähler Dirac field. So naively, that's what the symmetry is. You might worry for these gap fields that I have no idea um, whether they really restore Lorentz invariants. So I, I'm not sure this is the correct symmetry for the E and E prime fields. But it is, I think, the correct symmetry for the O and the O primed because those are weakly coupled, basically non-interacting fields. And for that, the usual proofs that these discrete lattice symmetries give rise to a certain continuum symmetry should hold, right? So if you ask, this gets back to a question way back a long time ago as to how those symmetries act. 
the way Lorentz symmetry acts, it acts by left multiplication on this four by four matrix. This internal flavor symmetry acts by right multiplication. All right. So, so that's what I expect now for the sort of naive continuum limit. And it should at least be good for the O and O prime blocks. Um, but there's an additional condition. I, I put this Majorana condition, this reality condition on the snagged field, which said that psi dagger was right to the psi transpose. That translates into a relationship between O and O primed, E and E primed. Let's just focus on the O and the O primed. So these guys, you know, O primed conveys no new information. If you take the field equation for O primed, it's basically the complex conjugate of that for O. And it's just enforced because of this generalized charge conjugation condition. So these blocks are no primed. So let's assume I've removed E and E primed because I gapped them out. O and O primed themselves are basically, those two blocks give rise to basically two Majorana fermions. Um, and I can basically get all the physics out of a single, uh, out of O basically. O prime just gives me the appropriate conjugates that I need to build a four component Majorana spinner. Most of the physics is in O, or all the physics is in O, sorry. Right, so again, so assuming symmetric mass generation is such that I can remove E and E primed from the description, everything relies on O and O primed and they span two Majorana fermions. Remember I started with four, I've thrown half of them away, I hope by gapping. So I get down to two Majorana fermions, which are contained in these two by two blocks. All right, so here's the naive continuum symmetry. So I start off with this Lorentz symmetry, this flavor symmetry, here's my Z8, and then I had the spin seven which I needed to get right the Yukawa interaction down. I hope the continuum symmetry should be okay for at least for the O modes, chi minus. Um, this just tells me how, how the symmetries would act naively on the de blocks. So for example, O is a left-handed fermion, contains left-handed fermions, um, and they transform in the two one flavor representation, the internal flavor representation. O primed is a right-handed fermion and it's in the one, two representation. So this generalized charge conjugation allows me to relate those blocks like that. So all the light degrees of freedom in the end are basically carried by O. And that compare, com corresponds to a pair of massless, or two because it's a two by two block. So the two columns give me two flavors, two internal flavors, two, a pair of massless Majorana or vial fermions. Since I start off with eight copies of the whole thing, I get down to 16. Now all left-handed vial fermions if the mass of these Majoranas goes to zero in the continuum limit. So that's the argument that this, the spectrum of this theory should in the end look like um, uh, vial fermions of a fixed handedness, fixed chirality, right? Because they come from one block which transforms uh, as a, all the two fermions in here are both left-handed. Any questions? I know I'm probably out of time at this point, aren't I? I have to, gosh, I mean, I should just. Uh, well, don't worry, you, you can still go through. Okay, whatever. so, so I, let me just make a few casual remarks. I mean, this magic number of fermions that we found and we can debate whether it's right or not, but <laughs> the argument I see seems to give me 16. If I play the same game in two dimensions, I still need eight Meyer, I still need, um, eight reduced staggered fermions, that's just fixed by the need uh, to, to cancel out the Z8 symmetry. But in that case, there's only one Majorana fermion emerging from the block. There's no block, it's just a one by one thing. So I just need eight Majorana spinners in total or possibly eight vial fields in the continuum limit. So that matches what you expect for the continuum. In three dimensions, of course, chi is zero. So you have to play a different game. And one thing you could do is replace S3 by B3, which has chi of one. Now you have a Z4 symmetry um, and each reduced staggered fermion yields four Majorana fermions in the continuum. With four flavors, I get 16 Majoranas. In the so there's some sense in which these reduced staggered fermions are giving me the right counting of fermions that I expect from discrete anomaly cancellation in, in the continuum. Um, although it is arguable because I have to pick the topology I need to do the trick. There's a connection to Paddy Salam, which I can briefly allude to, it's almost obvious at this point. Um, first of all, I can trivially gauge the spin seven symmetry, right? My interaction is purely on site. So that's already spin seven gauge invariant. 
The only thing I have to worry about is the kinetic terms, but I can gauge them and I went in the standard way I would do for any lattice gauge theory, just by inserting appropriate parallel transporters, uh, which would act on chi's in the eight dimensional real representation of spin seven, they're just matrices. That would give me something which looks like a covariant derivative in the continuum limit. So at least at that level, it looks like I can, if the gapping works and if I, I end up with only a light spectrum determined by chi minus, it would be a chiral gauge theory where I'd gauge the spin seven. Um, I can break that spin seven down to spin six if I want, either by Higgsing or by, as Chen Kuzhu actually originally did this uh, several years ago now by just truncating the sigmas to just run from one to six rather than one to seven. Um, that breaks the eight down into a four plus four bar. That's well-known stuff. Um, if I look at the fermions therefore, once I've broken spin seven down to spin six, it will break into a four plus four bar, but then I have to conjugate all the fermions, which has the effect because of this generalized charge conjugation flipping the internal flavor representation from two one to one two for the right handed fermions. So when I replace four bar left by four right, I have to simultaneously flip the internal flavor, right? Um, this fermion matter representation plus this symmetry group SU4 cross SU2 cross SU2, SU4 being spin six, that's exactly the starting point for the constructing the Paddy Salam gut model. So it seems like you have the ingredients here uh, to target something like Paddy Salam. It's tricky to gauge the weak SU2, but, uh, but in principle, the global symmetries all match and the matter representations match. You know? And then in principle, you can embed the standard model in this in, in a standard way, um, which is well known. I'm not gonna, since we're running short of time, I won't say anything about that. This is just standard Paddy Salam. Sorry, a question, naive question. Earlier yeah. about this, yeah, the Paddy Salam group, do you still have a keep the ZA somewhere in the theory? I know in the Paddy Salam, you can find a Z4, which is the uh, Z4 center yeah, of I think you do. I don't, I think you do. SU2. But uh, I'm not sure there's a Z8. Yeah, that's true. I don't know, but there's, no, the Z8 is not there, I guess. That's true. Yeah. That's why I'm, I know. Yeah, I agree. I, agree. I think I agree with that. Yeah, that's true. Let me summarize, because I'm definitely over at this point. Um, so what, I'm, what I've hoped, I persuaded you that there's something interesting about reduced staggered fermions in, in, in the sense of possibly allowing, not only just allowing symmetric mass generation, but symmetric mass generation, which is potentially capable of generating a, a, a theory with a, a chiral continuum limit. And certainly a necessary condition for symmetric mass generation is cancellation of anomalies. And I pointed out one set of anomalies which apply sort of semi-uniquely to Kähler-Dirac or equivalently staggered fermions. Uh, and, they, it, and canceling that anomaly out seems to be consistent with the structure of the, the FK interaction that was written down in 2009. So that's sort of a nice connection, I think, back into condensed matter physics. Uh, I, I showed you they're basically gravitational anomalies uh, and, they're, uh, and they have this amazing fact, this is an amazing fact that you can compute the anomaly exactly in the lattice theory, there are no corrections. Um, and that's just because it has this sort of topological flavor to it. Um, in principle, the spin seven symmetry at least can be gauged. Uh, and in principle, that gives me a chiral gauge theory, I, I, right? Um, there may be, okay, so there's, I showed you a connection to Paddy Salah modulo this Z8 business. Um, and of course, we're in the process of doing some numerical work now um, and hopefully we, uh, we'll have some idea about how it works out in four dimensions uh, within the next few months, um, unless we hit sign problems and things like that. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, for the great, wonderful lecture seminars and explain beautifully. Questions from the audience, feel free. Uh, Simon, uh, how do you check for sign problems? Uh, your... On small lattices, I compute the Fafian explicitly. <laughs> That's the answer. So it, it doesn't. So I can do it on four cubed and six cubed easily. I can do it on eight cubed with a bit of effort. Uh, but beyond that, I can't really do it. 
I can try to track the behavior of the low any the the eigen modes uh, the eigen values. So see if they track through zero. You know there are ways to do that, although I haven't spent any time trying that yet. But you could try to scale it up by just focusing attention on the on what's happening to the low lying modes. And you know as they track through zero, that's when you get a sign change, typically. But I haven't thought in detail about that right now. I'm just literally making a full matrix out of this operator just for measurement and just measuring it every so often. And I have yet, for the couplings I showed you, I have never seen a sign change ever in you know, thousands of trajectories. So I think it's solid where we are right now. It, if we have to scale the coupling up to very strong values, then I have seen it. I, even on small ladders, I've seen it change sign. So if we have to go to very large G, that might be a limiting um, you know, factor for doing Monte Carlo simulation at least. In fact, I mentioned this to my quantum computing person and he said, great, this is a great model we can use for quantum, justifying quantum computing. <laughs> so what we think of as a negative, he thought was a great positive. And, and, and how fast does it appear in the simulation? Is it kind of like an oscillation or you may have to wait and then there is a sudden flip of sign? I'm no, you see, you see large forces. You can sort of see it getting close to the origin. You, you, you can see that in the acceptance rate of the algorithm and things like that. Um, you know, so when it's going to happen, you sort of see it. Uh, and then you start to see other things go off. Uh, things you're measuring in the phase quenched ensemble start to deviate as well from what you expect. Um, so there, are, but uh, like I say, everything I showed you today is, is fine. Um, as far as I know, up to at least, well, certainly we've checked explicit to the six cubed. Uh, I see no evidence that larger lattices are su suffering from any problems, but I haven't actually checked those, I guess. Um, but I certainly know that if you crank, if you take like, if you take the symmetric case where big G equals little g and you crank them up to order a few, you know, five, you will definitely see sign changes there. So it's not guaranteed, there's no symmetry that's guaranteeing an absence of sign problems, unlike the original vector model. It can generate them and maybe we, maybe we'll find out we need to be there in the end uh, to get the physics right, but, or maybe in four dimensions it'll be worse, I don't know. Thanks. I mean, this is running on my laptop right now. So <laughs> we're not doing super computing here. <laughs> Can I ask a couple of questions? Yeah, sure, David. Um, I, I'm interested that you, you're hitting on Patty Salam. Are you, are, you, are you getting that because it's left-right symmetric? It's parity invariant, even though it's, it's, it's chiral? Well, it's funny. It's the SU2 cross SU2 is coming from that internal flavor structure of Kayla Dirac. That's where that's coming from. And SU4 I'm choosing because I have my spin seven at least contains it, right? So that's less obvious. So the, the weak sector seems to be dictated by the internal flavor structure associated with mapping Kena Dirac back into fermions. But that, yeah. that's, that's sort of geometric in, in nature yeah, and therefore you're gonna get a parity invariant yeah. theory. It's rather cute because it sort of ties the, ha the handedness to some internal flavor symmetry which you have no control over. It has to be SU2 in four dimensions. Um, so I, well, I think that's kind of nice. But one, one thing I, I, I noticed recently is that in, in this paper I had last year, we, we had a way to gap standard model fermions without breaking uh -huh. the, the yeah. using some supersymmetric dynamics. But, but mm -hmm. what I noticed is that actually the, the mechanism we were using was in, in the end parity invariant. I, I didn't realize in the paper. So it's not Patty Salam, but it's, it's a chiral mm -hmm. theory that has parity. Mm -hmm. but remains chiral. Yeah. So it, I mean, it has some right. flavor of the same thing you're, you're, you're finding. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I, I, once you go to this Kähler rack prescription, of course, the notion of parity is sort of different as well. It's like the notion of charge conjugation. Instead of just being sigma two psi star, you get another sigma two on the right-hand side, which is now associated with flavor. I see. Oh, but that, that's exactly what you need in Patti Salam, right? You want to swap the, the, the yes. two gates. So when you conjugate, it flips two one to one two. That's that's exactly why you get the right representations when you do the. So you absolutely is important to break eight down to four plus four bar. That's what gives you the complex conjugation. And that also flips the flavor ones down as well. So, yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't know anything about Patty Slam other than that representation. <laughs> don't ask me what Higgs fields you need to break it down to the standard model, but it's pretty ugly after that point, actually, I think. Um, but it's sort of, it's cute, you know, it's cute that it seems like it has the ingredients for it almost, at least up to the C8 that June mentioned, I don't really understand. 
I mean, my feeling is that the, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Did you have Excellent. another question, David? I, I sort of did, but I'm, I, I think I figured it out what, before I've said it, but I'll ask anyway. And if, if you really have a, a chiral gauge theory on a lattice, the sign problem is, is unavoidable. And the, the partition function has a phase. There's, there's yeah. nothing you can do about it. But you're sort of not at that step yet, right? That, that's the step when you're summing over the gauge fields. Yeah, right, just right. Before you get there. And also remember, we're not really in the chiral limit until you take A to zero as well. So it might be something that comes back, roaring back at you as you take A smaller and smaller. Right. We still have at the moment just some funny lattice model, right? <laughs> With single component fermions sitting on lattice sites. Um, so the chiral nature is only emergent, you know, in the continuum. It's it's not a chiral gauge theory at any finite lattice spacing in some sense, right? So no. I don't know whether you expect therefore it to come roaring back. Like I can say I've seen it strong coupling that there are sign problems. And that's what I was expecting. I thought we'd just do some phase quench thing, see if it looked roughly okay. And I was surprised to see that, you know, where we were running in the beginning, there didn't seem to be much of a sign problem at all. And notice here, it's not clear you need to find a continuum limit for the gap fermions. You don't care about them. Yeah. If they don't, if they break Lorentz invariance, but they're above the cutoff, who cares? You know, yeah. it's, it's not hundred percent clear. You need to look for a second order phase transition in this model, so which is, is again, is why a, I, yeah. Is, is it a, a generic property that, that you dial some parameter and for some values, there's no sign problem. And then you, you go through no. something of a phase transition where it not appears? <laughs> not that I know of, no. Hmm. Uh, I mean, often it gets worse in some limits, but uh, this is, it's sort of funny that uh, on, at least on these small lattices at the couplings we've run out, we're just not seeing any. I have to really push the couplings way up to see it. Is, is it just uh, that they, it could be exponentially suppressed in those, in those yeah. couplings? So you do and maybe as you go to large volumes, it comes back to bite. Hmm. I mean, that is entirely possible. Um, so I, I, I mean, I, what I, literally I, what I'm showing you is results that ran for two or three weeks on my laptop and my students. We haven't run this on anything. We have a parallel code now, but we haven't really run it yet. Um, and, and we certainly haven't looked in four dimensions, which of course is the interesting case. Um, and where the story could be different. And maybe this whole thing fall, falls over at that point. Um, but by the way, I think I have an answer to my previous question, which is that the reason S... Uh, S4 is important is because it's it's the manifold with the smallest Euler, Euler character. So if you did K3, you'll get 24 or something instead of two. But yeah, that, that would you know that would be a bigger group. So Z8 is the is, is the smallest group. So I think it is yeah. it is it's a slightly odd thing to do, but it's a sense. And by the way, I mean I you might be even to, even able to interpolate to sort of domain wall like setups here by taking you know systems with a boundary and using the appropriate chi for that. And I don't know whether you can separate chi plus and chi minus onto separate bound to separate walls and I haven't really thought about that. You know, the domain wall setup would definitely have a different constraint potentially. It's like taking the bound the B3 for S3, right? I don't know. I yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so thanks uh, question and comments. So first of all the Z8, I think just to summarize, I think the fact is as far as I know, is that the SU4 uh, in the party salon group SU4 times SU2L times SU2R, which mm -hmm. you can model uh, Z2, a common Z2 from the diagonal of the SU2 mm -hmm. left, right, and SU4. You can right. decide to model Z2 or not. They are two versions of party salon. But in either case, I think you can only find a Z4 symmetry inside the center of SU4 if you choose that Z4 to be a B minus L. Yes. If you choose that Z4 to be a mixing between uh, B minus L and hypercharge Y, which is commonly known as five times of B minus L minus four mm -hmm. Y, like a uh, discover mm -hmm. maybe by wheelchair and Z. I think that one you can mix between the SU4 center and the SU2Rs, the one of the U1, the third T3 generator of the SU2R. Yeah. But I'm not sure the obvious way to find ZA. So perhaps if you really want to keep ZA, the ZA might be outside. Maybe just my knowledge. Uh, there are various permutations and variations in Paddy Salon, but you're right. I've never seen a Z8. I've seen a Z4. Right. So, so if you want to keep the Z8, maybe there's additional Z8 somewhere yeah. outside the Paddy Salon, which yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And another thing about the numerics, it seems like you suggest there could be a continuous space transition. Is that well, the I'm, I'm robust? Not, I'm not sure I need one is what I was saying at the moment. Um, Cause I, the, 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 the weekly interacting sector has a continuum limit. Right? It's a we know what the continuum limit is of the massless non-interacting 
say chi minus sector, the O sector, right? We don't need a, a new non-trivial phase transition for that. The row is already one at G equals zero, right? So that sector is, is, is basically free theory. If I don't gauge the spin seven, it's just a free theory. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm asking the natural phase transition. It seems like uh, you show the second order phase transitions in, by numerics. In, in, so. the, in the case where we, we looked at the SO4 model, then I think you 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 know you're you're wanting to construct a uh, a real you want a second order phase transition to construct a, a continuum limit with a finite renormalized mass right mm -hmm. this is different because I want to keep some of my fermions massless and the other guys I just want up at the cutoff and it's not clear to me that you need to do any tuning other other than pushing those guys up to the cutoff so you don't need to find a non-trivial phase transition at non-zero g because that would only be relevant for taking the continuum limit for the gap fermions, which I don't care about. Or at least oh, I could take that. No. Right. So how about the chiral theory? Do, do you know the... Well, then then you would be... It's all, at least as long, as long... Okay. So as long as it was weakly coupled chiral theory, the argument would go through the same way. If you ask me what about if I make the spin seven strongly coupled, then, and then I have to think about it. I'm not even sure that staggered fermions are the right way to do this anymore. Maybe one should just use the Kähler Dirac equation and its discrete form directly with things on simple, you know, fields living on simplices and give up on this staggered prescription, which is kind of a bastardization of the geometry, the geometrical flavor of Kähler Dirac. So I'm not even sure that staggered fermions in the long run is the best way to do this as a numerical approach. It might be one should go directly to Kähler Dirac. Let, let me make sure. Uh... Just make sure the natural phase transition. Is there some like a uh, principle you know when the transition between uh, the uh, the Galois theory to the symmetric mass generate phase? Is that the transition need to be continuous, second order, or if you want to take the mass to be finite yeah, in the continuum, one, be, uh, first order, you need a continuous transition. Otherwise, it's going to be a cutoff scale mass. And that's what I'm saying for the chiral model. I don't know that I care. Right, I, the 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 states I'm trying to gap, I don't care about them. Have a continuum limit for them. I just want to push them up to the cutoff and out of the way. Right. And the continuum limit for the low, the light guys, is just the usual massless continuum limit you get at g equals zero. And that's well known and understood. And sim you know that the symmetry is restored in the usual way there. I think, if that makes sense. I should stop sharing this. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> any comment questions? In any case, let's thank uh, Simon for the great uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.